My name is Stephen Farr, and I'm sitting here in the music gallery of the Horniman Museum uh, to play this beautiful chamber organ uh, attributed to Joseph Bellaudi from about 1800. The first piece I'm going to play is a voluntary by uh, the 18th century British composer John Stanley. Stanley's a very interesting figure. Uh, he was blinded, almost blinded, in uh, a domestic accident at the age of two. But despite this, went on to have an enormously successful career. He was something of a child prodigy. Ended up as organist of the Temple Church, where Handel himself used to bustle in at the end of the service to make sure he caught Stanley's closing voluntary. And Stanley directed many of Handel's oratorios in concert performances in London. He wrote 30 voluntaries, and many of them are designed to display particular kind of solo colours of the instrument of the period, like the trumpet or the bassoon or the French horn, those kind of orchestral sounds uh, which were becoming very fashionable in the period. This one uh, is more about the kind of sound of the full organ, that is actually the performance direction, full organ. Um, and while we haven't got quite such a magnificent tutti on this very elegant small instrument as Stanley might have expected, uh, it still gives a sense of the full chorus of the instrument. Thank you. 
Next two miniature pieces by Charles Wesley Jr. He was the son of the famous hymn writer Charles Wesley Sr. and brother of Samuel, uh, who was also uh, a very well-known composer. Uh, it's an air and a gavotte. Uh, taken from a collection uh, called 12 Pieces for Organ, although actually there are 13. It's a bit of a proofreading fail. Um, the air is specified to be played on a, a sort of variety of solo colours, but it fits really beautifully just on the single eight-foot flute stop that I'm using. And then the gavotte is a little bit perkier, and I'm using a slightly stronger sound, eight and four foot. Hugo Distler was a German composer um, of the first half of the 20th century. Um, his career in the end took him to be organist of the two magnificent uh, historic instruments in the Jakobikirche in Lübeck. Uh, he came unfortunately to a tragic end. He committed suicide in 1942, but left uh, a small but extremely distinguished corpus of uh, music for a variety of mediums. I'm playing pieces from a little set called uh, just 30 pieces um, and they're designed very much with a small domestic instrument in mind. Um, Distler specifies that certain groups of them can be put together to make many kind of sonatas or sonatinas but the three that I'm playing today I've just chosen to form a discrete and a contrasting group. Thank you. 
earlier, I mentioned the connection between John Stanley and Handel. So I thought it might be nice just to include a little bit of Handel for purposes of comparison, if you like. This is just a tiny little miniature from a set of pieces called the Aylesford pieces. Um, and it's a voluntary on a flight of angels and was designed to be played on a little sort of musical clock, like a cuckoo clock that had a pipe organ inside it. Um, it's very, very kind of delicate, sort of sparkly music. And you can hear them sort of flitting around the sky, I think. So those of you that are interested in classical music, maybe even some of you play the piano or the organ yourselves, might be scratching your heads at this point about the inclusion of Bartok in a program of organ music. Uh, well, these aren't really organ pieces. I've cheated a little bit. Um, I'm playing some movements from a wonderful collection called Microcosmos, which is a, a graded set of piano pieces. I think they're about 150 in total over six volumes. And they start with very, very easy and they finish with quite advanced sort of professional concert music. Uh, although they're written for the piano, Bartok himself says in the preface to the collection that some of them can be played on the harpsichord. And so uh, in a laterally thinking kind of way, I had a look through the collection for some that seemed to fit the organ. Um, and there are a few, that are especially those that involve more sustained kind of styles of writing or that seem to allude to the Baroque era that seem to me to really transfer very, very well. So the set is bookended by two slightly kind of chorale-like pieces. And then in the middle, there's a chromatic invention. Um, and then there's a little fragment, uh, sort of homage to J.S. Bach.
One of the things I like trying to do when I play these lovely historic instruments, especially smaller instruments, is to try and include contemporary music. Um, and so in today's programme, I've slipped in a piece by a composer called Maurizio Cargel, uh, who died in 2008. He's a German-Argentine composer. Um, and it's from a collection called this, which I won't try to pronounce. Um, there are eight pieces in the collection in total, and each of them has a title which begins with the letter R. And the piece I'm playing is the first of the set. It's called Raga. And the Raga is an Indian melodic scale, um, part of an incredibly rich and sophisticated musical culture. Um, and it's just a single line all the way through. Um, quite fast, quite sort of furious. Um, and you can hear very kind of characteristic inflections in the melodic intervals. I'm finishing with a piece of 18th century German music. Uh, Johann Gottfried Walter uh, was a relation of Bach's, of J.S. Bach's, and they worked together in Weimar um, in the first couple of decades of the 18th century. Both Bach and Walter had a great interest in Italian music, people like Vivaldi and Torelli, Albinoni and Corelli. Uh, they both transcribed string concertos by these composers for keyboard performance. And the piece I'm playing is uh, not from a string concerto, but it's from, uh, based on material from a Corelli violin sonata. Um, and he takes the bass line of one of the movements and uses it to weave some variations of his own. Thank you. 
So my interest in this type of instrument probably began when I was a university student. Um, I studied at uh, Cambridge and played an instrument which was very much oriented towards the performance of Baroque music, although it was a modern instrument. So I played a lot of Bach, a lot of Buxtehude. When all my contemporaries were off playing 19th century French music, I was kind of there with the 17th century German. Um, and as I kind of continued to study, I uh, went abroad a few times to, to see well-known exponents of the repertoire. And it just became more and more a, a central aspect of what I liked to do as a musician. While some modern builders uh, do copy instruments from an earlier period, I mean, either literally in, in terms of being inspired by a particular instrument or builder, or more generally in terms of the kind of principles of the tonal design and the sort of sounds that the instruments make. I think uh, I'm not aware of anybody who's, who's copied an instrument quite like this. In general, these small sort of three-stop instruments, they're generally built for use with ensembles, um, you know, to play in things like Bach Passions or Handel Oratorios, but uh, not really conceived for solo performance. So although some of the fundamental aspects of an instrument like this aren't going to be unfamiliar to anybody who plays the modern organ, there are two main sort of features uh, which can catch people unawares. Um, the first is that you might notice there isn't a music desk. Um, and uh, it makes me think of a scene in Blackadder where um, Talbot Buxomley, who's the appalling MP for wherever it is, um, has guests in the house and they comment on the fact that he doesn't have any furniture. And he says, why should I have tables when I have men standing idle? Um, and he uses his footmen sort of as coffee tables. Um, so um, what must have happened is that whoever owned this instrument had a valet or a flunky standing there holding the score for him. Whether that was a good job to have or not, I wouldn't like to speculate. So that's the first thing. And you might have noticed that I have a, a kind of music desk just on one side for the copies. The second thing um, is that there is no electric blower, nothing to generate the wind. Organs have to have wind, breath to sound. Um, on a modern instrument, you push a button and an electric blower starts up and there's the wind and you don't have to think about it. Here, uh, there is a foot pedal, which you have to operate at the same time as you play. Um, it's fine as long as you remember to keep doing it. So um, I just, there's a little weight here, which tells you when the bellows are full of air and the organ's ready to speak. So uh, there's air in the bellows now and here we are. And if you stop pumping, that's what happens. Um, and the particular kind of challenge when you're playing is that you have to remember not to pump faster and harder when you're playing faster, more difficult music because it doesn't actually make the instrument work any better. So you have to sort of decouple your, your feet and your fingers in a kind of slightly unusual way. So now we tend to think of the organ um, as very much associated with the church, uh, you know, sitting in the shadows in a huge cathedral or in a, in a big parish church. Um, since the 19th century, there's also been um, a big association between concert halls and organs. So in the 19th century, you know, um, an organ in a big concert hall in a place like Liverpool or Manchester was a kind of expression of civic and commercial pride. Um, but actually the organ has another sort of more secret kind of life um, as, a, as a domestic and chamber instrument. I mean, there's a, a very beautiful 17th century instrument in um, Knoll House in Seven Hoaks, Seven Hoaks which uh, must have been used for domestic music making. Um, and I think almost certainly this very lovely thing here uh, was used for domestic purposes. So in the days before television and the internet, um, when you'd finished dinner, you would 
gather around and his lordship would play you a selection of hits from the latest Stanley Oratorio. The challenge with making any kind of music sound expressive on any kind of organ, actually, is that um, the sound is kind of either on or off. Uh, once you've started making a sound, you can't really change it. Um, except by kind of moving to another note and you start the process again. So organists um, are reliant on various kind of tricks, I suppose you'd call them. So the way we make things expressive on the organ is um, on an instrument like this, it's possible to control the speed with which a note speaks. You can make it come to life faster or slower, depending on how you press the key. Um, you can explore various kind of subtle ways of connecting notes to each other, whether they're more or less smooth. Um, and you can fake kind of accent and stress and release in that way. Um, the other thing that an organist has in, in his or her armory is uh, what's called agogics. So by playing things a little bit late or a little bit early, you kind of um, manipulate the pulse of the music in a very, very small way at a very, very microscopic level. And that, in combination with the other two sort of devices that I, that I mentioned, just enables you to create, I suppose it's an illusion of, of dynamic change. Organists as a breed are famous for being fond of jargon. Unfortunately, it's a terrible habit. Um, and when we choose the sounds that we're going to use in a piece of music, we like to call it registration. Um, register is another name for stop, the kind of individual sound. Um, and at some points in the history of the instrument, in particular kind of traditions, composers have been very specific about the kind of sound they want, especially in French music, for example. Um, it's invariably the case that the composer specifies with you know, great exactitude the sound that they want to hear. So sometimes it's a complicated process if you have a big instrument and a complicated piece of music. This instrument just has three stops. Um, luckily, they're all perfectly formed. Lovely, lovely individual sounds. So um, I'm going to get the wind going while I talk to you um, and just give you a little flavour of each at a time. So uh, this is called the stopped diapason um, and uh, it's an eight foot pitch, which means that the longest pipe um, is eight feet long. Everything's done in imperial measurements rather than metric with the organ. Um, so if you play middle C on this stop, it's the same pitch as you would get if you played middle C on the piano. Sounds like this. Very nice kind of delicate little flutes. Then um, next, there's a stop called uh, principal, um, which is just another little bit of organ jargon. Um, and this is a four foot pitch, so it sounds an octave higher. And then finally, there's a stop called the 15th, which is two feet long. Um, and 15th is because it sounds two octaves higher. So if you play middle C, you get a note which is two octaves, 15 notes higher. And it sounds like this. And then you can, of course, combine them in various kind of permutations. So this is the eight foot and the two foot together. This is the eight and the four together. And this is all three together, the grand tutti. And in the music that I'm playing today, uh, the composers don't stipulate at all what sounds you should use. And in fact, some of the music is conceived either not for the organ at all, or for instruments of a very different type and, and sort of tonal design. So really, it's up to the imagination of the individual player to try and match what he or she understands of the, the sort of idiom and expression of the music with, with the sort of sounds available.